Food photography is an area in advertising that poses many interesting challenges. On one hand, the food has to look as good and appetizing as possible. On the other hand, achieving that often requires some level of cheating. So the creative team behind the photo shoot, art directors, food stylists, photographers, and retouchers have to make a decision. How far can we veer from how the real product looks without crossing into false advertising? One approach is to completely deconstruct the food into its individual components, like in this ready-made meal. This approach works great for multiple reasons. First off, it removes the pressure of making an unappealing dish look appetizing. But most importantly, it's a great way to also imply how fresh the ingredients are. But what do you do with products that need a more straightforward product shot? For example, a burger. When you're in line waiting to order, you need to see what it is you're getting. So in this case, if you want your product to look good, <laughs> You just lie and cheat, but within boundaries. This is exactly the issue McDonald's faced several years ago when customers started noticing that the product shots looked nothing like the real thing. Hi, I'm Hope Bagazi, Director of Marketing for McDonald's Canada. And I'm here with a question from Isabel M. from Toronto, Ontario. She asks, why does your food look different in the advertising than what's in the store? It's a great question, Isabel. We get asked that a lot. And if you want to come with me, I'm going to take you across the street. We're going to find out a bit more. Come on. Hello. Could I please order our quarter pounder with cheese? This is a segment from a campaign McDonald's ran in 2013 addressing this exact issue. This was a very smart campaign. It acknowledged the problem and it also took the viewer backstage showing them the whole procedure from beginning to end. And uh, from my own experience in advertising, I can tell you that this is exactly how a product is shot nowadays. The real-world ingredients, like the patty and the buns in McDonald's case, are actually used in the photo shoot, but they are enhanced and carefully art directed by the creative team. Which brings us to the idea behind this video. Since we're already creating an alternative version of the real product, why not take things to the next level? Why not do everything in 3D? Some companies, especially in the snack sector, already use this approach. But of course, this has its own set of challenges. Creating realistic looking food is tricky. So in this video, I'll try to recreate McDonald's photo of the quarter pounder burger, but entirely in 3D. Let's go. Modeling everything from scratch is the faster way to do things, but I still want to follow the principles of regular, real-world product shots. So the plan here is to try and use the actual ingredients of the burger as much as possible. And I'll do that with 3D scanning. Due to the nature of the ingredients though, I'm limited to very specific things, like the patty, the top and bottom buns, and maybe the pickles. But the rest, mustard, ketchup, cheese, and onions, they have to be modeled. Scanning adds a lot more time in production, but at least this way I can say that the final render uses some of the real ingredients from the burger, so it's not 100% fake. But first we need to get the ingredients. So let's order a couple of burgers. I'm going to order two different versions, one that has all the ingredients so we can see how the actual product looks, and one without any ketchup, mustard, or cheese, so it's easier to scan the putty and buns. It's insane how expensive McDonald's can get if you order online. 14 euros and 20 cents is a ridiculous amount to pay for just two burgers. Whatever, it is what it is. And there we have it. This is how the quarter pounder with cheese actually looks. I think there's no denying that the product shot looks infinitely better than the real thing. Now let's check the individual elements. The patty looks a lot drier than the product shot. In the photo, the meat looks very juicy and tasty, and in reality, the patty doesn't really resemble any sort of meat. So I should definitely try to imitate the photo rather than the real ingredient. The top bun is a lot more compact than the photo. It doesn't have this nice looking height we can see in the product shot. But in this case, I like the idea of sticking closer to the real ingredient, so I won't adjust the height of the bun at all. 
And when it comes to onions, they're all over the map. We do have the shapes uh, shown in the product shot, but we also have onion pieces in all shapes and sizes. For the onions, I'll definitely imitate the product shot. The shapes are a lot nicer than the real thing. When it comes to pickles in the real burger, we don't see them at all. In this case, I'll go with the product shot. I like the decision to clearly showcase all the ingredients, even though in reality, both the onion and pickles are sitting deep inside the burger. So, I think we have a plan in place. Let's now start scanning. In order for me to properly scan the patty, I need to have it stand upwards. So, I'll have to make some modifications. To create the necessary support, I'm going to use paper clips and some tape. I know it looks incredibly clunky, but it actually works really well. The four paper clips are strong enough to support the weight of the patty. The scan uses 175 pictures in total, and for what it is, I think it turned out great. I wouldn't really call this meat, but <laughs> that's exactly how the real world quarter pounder patty actually looks. With the scan in hand, the rest of the process is quite standard. I first clean up the scan and get rid of the unnecessary geometry. The tape is very easy to get rid of since it's just a matter of selecting the polygons and deleting them. To get rid of the paper clips, I move the model to ZBrush to take advantage of DynaMesh. I first hide the geometry I want to get rid of, delete it, and then use a high value in DynaMesh to close the holes but also keep all the scanned details. And then it's just a matter of doing a few touch-ups here and there. <laughs> I just can't get over how this patty looks, it's just so weird. I quickly create some new UVs in Cinema in order to get back some nicely projected textures that I can easily edit in Photoshop. Projecting the geometry and texture to the low res mesh happens in ZBrush. I won't go into details here, but if you want to learn more, I have a whole video about the process. So make sure to check either the video on the top right or the description below. But it's nothing too complex, it's just tedious work, especially if you have to do this multiple times a day. And here's how the patty looks with a diffuse texture in place. Yeah, I know. So, let's go ahead and give some life to this poor piece of meat. To create the roughness map, I'm using Substance Painter. Substance Painter and uh, Substance Designer are the two apps I love to hate. Both have some of the clunkiest and most convoluted UIs out there, but at the same time they're incredibly powerful. So even though I don't like using them, I do like the results I'm getting out of them. With uh, Painter and Designer, it's very easy to create procedural and flexible setups that you can adjust and refine at any point in time. For the patty, I don't need much. The only thing I'm doing here is adjusting the roughness map to get these small little glossy parts on the surface of the patty. A couple of adjustments later and a little bit of cleanup of the diffuse map and we have the look we're after. A glistening piece of mystery meat. So with that out of the way, let's take care of the buns. For the top bun, I complicated things a little too much, but I like to think it's for the best. As you can see, both the sesame seeds and the bun were captured at the same time, but if I keep them that way as one single object, it'll be difficult to properly set up the materials later on. I tried to separate them by using ZBrush's depth mask, but for this extremely tiny height difference, the brush didn't work properly. So I decided to just erase all the sesame seeds and model them as a separate object. To get rid of them, I used the Smooth Peaks brush in ZBrush, which does exactly what you think it does. It gets rid of the peaks. This procedure is as exciting as it sounds, and by that I mean extremely boring. Imagine erasing 70, 80, or however many sesame seeds were there, one by one. Maybe there's another way to do this, so if you have a better idea, let me know in the comments below. It might save me some time in the future. And after what felt like 5 billion years, I had a nice clean canvas to work with. At this point, I think it's clear that modeling this from scratch would have been much faster. 
And keep in mind that I also have to get rid of these sesame seeds from the texture as well. Thankfully, this is also an easy fix in Photoshop. It's just a matter of making a few good selections, increasing and feathering the masks, and then using content aware fill. The result is not perfect, but with a couple more adjustments, we have the result we're after. All in all, adjusting this texture took around 10 minutes. It felt like 10 hours, <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't that hard. <laughs> this is the point in the process where I start getting bored and start cutting corners. So my initial plan was to model three or so sesame seeds, just to have this variance in looks and shapes. But after modeling one, I decided that one was more than enough. Thankfully, the next task is a lot more fun. A few years ago, spreading the sesame seeds on the surface of the bun would have been an annoying process. But thankfully, a few releases ago, Cinema introduced the scatter brush, which is a nicer and more art directable way of doing things. With the sesame seed selected and the scatter brush enabled, it's just a matter of drawing onto the surface of the bun. You can pretty much adjust everything you might need position, rotation, scale, basically all the things that can introduce some nice variance to your design. The only annoying thing with the scatter brush is that you can only adjust these settings on your last stroke, so you can't really go back to a previous stroke and change these settings. I could have sworn that there was a way to do this, but it looks like I'm misremembering. But the amazing thing is that we can manually adjust the position, scale, and rotation of the individual instances. Which of course I did, because I'm insane. Anyway, after some tweaking I got the result I was after. I purposefully shoved some of these seeds further into the bun because I've noticed that in the real bun the seeds were not cleanly placed on the surface. But yeah. I think that's enough sesame seeds for one video. Let's now move on to modeling the cheese slices. To get the initial shape of the cheese deforming on the surface of the burger, I used Cinema's cloth system. Each slice is essentially a plain object with a soft body tag. To get the thickness I wanted, I just put the plain object inside a cloth surface. And that's it, it's nothing too complicated. A quick little tip to avoid having your cloth stretch to insane lengths. When that happens, you need to increase the smoothing iterations in the simulation tab of the project's preferences. Once you do that, your simulation will work in a more predictable manner. It'll be slower, but things will be more art directable. Now, once the basic overall shape is done, I make the object editable and further adjust it with the sculpting brushes. This is the point where I stumbled on a very weird bug in Cinema. For whatever reason, these sculpting brushes don't work when you have the picture viewer docked. So to keep an eye on the reference, I had to constantly switch between apps, Cinema and macOS's preview app. For the cheese sitting on top of the patty, the steps are exactly the same. I just love it when a program's features work in a synergistic manner. For example, using cinema simulation tools along with sculpting, or using the scatter brush along with the placement tools, and so on and so forth. It just makes working on a project so much easier and feels like a very organic way of working. You don't have to fight the program to get what you want. Anyway, let's now go over a couple more objects. For the pickles, I was debating if I should model a simple pickle shape or just scan it. I ended up scanning a really thick slice that had nothing to do with a real product, but I then scaled it down to the y-axis to make it look thinner. Definitely not the most elegant way of doing things, but after modeling, scanning, UVing, and texturing all the other parts, I just grew a little impatient. The model doesn't have the detail I would have liked, but since you're only seeing a small portion of it, I decided that it's good enough. For the mustard and ketchup, I used Cinema's volumes. It's the best way to get these smooth, organic looking forms. The setup for each of these shapes is basically a collection of uh, three or four splines and then a couple of filters on top to create these elongated stringy shapes. 
VDBs work faster with bigger voxel sizes, so trying to use VDB on a real scale burger is going to be a nightmare. So here's what I ended up doing. I resized the whole burger to a ridiculous scale, I modeled all the ketchup and mustard shapes I needed, and once I had everything, I hit C to make the shapes editable, and then scaled everything down to the correct size. And now, with everything in place, it's finally time for the fun part. These types of product shots have very simple light setups. It's usually a couple of lights left and right, maybe a backlight, and that's about it. I ended up using two main lights, one very dim backlight, and a top light to mainly deal with the background. At this stage, none of the materials are finely tuned. It's just the textures connected to the proper nodes, and that's pretty much it. Once I have the basic setup of the scene ready, I then go in and slowly adjust things. Without subsurface scattering, food looks dull, so pretty much all materials in the scene have SSS enabled. To speed up render previews, I use very coarse values. I always uh, set the threshold value for the previews to 0.1, and I also don't use more than 100 passes. In most cases, this amount of detail is good enough to gauge how things will look. I tend to keep my cinema renders very flat. I always do the color corrections and final look in Photoshop, similar to how you would shoot a video in log format and then grade it in editing. But in this case, since I'm going to share the scene, I decided to do as much as possible in render. So when you open up the scene, you will notice that there's also a magic bullet looks adjustment. Unfortunately, magic bullet doesn't have the great color controls available in Photoshop, but it's good enough. And after a little bit more tweaking, the final image is complete. There's a ton of things I would have liked to adjust, but at some point you have to call things done. For the purposes of this video, I'm happy with this final result. If you want though to reach the next level of realism, you definitely have to go through all the materials one by one and tweak things until everything looks just right. Simple small things like adjusting the colors of the textures or the roughness and normal maps can make a huge difference. Either way though, now that you have access to the scene, just go in and adjust things to your liking. And that's it for this uh, video. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below and I'll do my best to answer them. Take care and I'll see you in the next one.